What's happening, everybody? We pray that the favor of God rests upon you, your family, your children. During this spring season, during this resurrection season, we are just believing God that everything that needs to come up will come up. Let my joy come up. Let my peace come up. Let my mind come up. Let my money come up. Let me be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. The Rock Church is in the building virtually. I need you to click like. I need you to click share. Help us evangelize. Do it for us right now. We believe we got a special word for you. We are in the middle of a series entitled Groundbreaking. It's been everything. Today we're going to unpack one of the bedrocks of our church, which is the idea of love. You're gonna experience love on a deeper level than you've ever realized before. And that's all I can say about it. Like, join us for this word. We'll holler at you as soon as it's over. Let's keep it 100. I believe that many of you all have been spoiled by this online worship experience. Straight up, there's some things I just don't need to know, but I got a sneaky suspicion that some of y'all have come to church multiple times in your pajamas. Like, don't, don't, don't raise your hand. Don't expose yourself. I don't want to know. But I have a sneaky suspicion that some of you all have been coming to church as if you were going to house party to pajama jammy jam. That's just my thoughts. Uh, I believe that some of you all also have a dual membership at Bedside Baptist and at Mattress Methodist. I, I just believe it. I just believe it. I'm not mad at you. I'm just glad you're here. I figured this morning, why don't I make you breakfast because of your faithfulness? And I'm going to do something special. This is one of our family's favorite breakfast meals. It's high caloric. Ain't nothing gluten free about it. Uh, so we don't have it often. But our family, we go crazy for biscuits and gravy. This groundbreaking series has been a game changer. Like the testimonies that we are receiving from business owners, from pastors, from parishioners, it's nothing short of phenomenal. Like literally some business owners and some pastors are like, can you come and speak to our entities? Our goal in this series, again, is not behavior modification that changes your behavior from the outside in, but it's our goal to transform who you are from the inside out. I need every Rock Church member, every Rock Church member, man, woman, boy, girl, I need every Rock Church member to memorize the seven bedrocks of the Rock Church. Like low key, if I see you in Whole Foods, if I see you in the grocery store and I stop you, I literally need you to have the ability to recite what are the seven bed rocks of the rock church. Like for real, this, I'm gonna give them to you real quick. Number one, evangelism. I need you to know inside and out that the primary concern of the rock church has been and will always be soul saved and lives transformed through the power of Jesus Christ. Evangelism. Some of y'all, if you're like me and you learn by typing things, then I need you to type it out in the chat. Evangelism is the first. Second bedrock is growth. I mean it. My motto is if you don't grow, you got to go. <laughs> like no shade, everything connected to the Rock Church has to be about holistic growth and empowerment. Healthy things grow. Things that are unhealthy eventually die and wither away. So growth is a foundational principle of the Rock Church. Also, outreach. Outreach. We're striving to turn our church inside out. Like, we believe that when you come to church online or in person, that ain't the game. 
So we don't fight for positions. We don't fight for attention. We believe that Sunday is the huddle and the real game occurs Monday through Saturday. We are all about outreach. Our church, we place a high premium on excellence. Yeah, like we have a high attention to detail. We are firm believers in excellence. The Bible says in everything you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. The psalmist said, oh, Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. At our church, we don't meddle with mediocrity. We are allergic to average. We believe in excellence. At the Rock Church, the next bed rock. Come on. You know what it is? Succession. Our belief is that you are not a success unless you have a successor. Paul had Timothy. Jesus had the disciples. Moses had Joshua. You are not a success unless you've identified and poured into a successor. If it stops with you, it should have never started. Straight up. At the Rock Church, we are resolved to have a legacy for the next generation. A spiritual legacy, emotional legacy, mental legacy, physical legacy, and a financial legacy. It's all about succession. This week, we are addressing love. Unequivocally, the Bible says, by this men will know your Christ's disciples by the love you show one towards another. And our final bedrock that we're going to address is prayer. Yep. Prayer is literally like what 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 air is for a natural person. Prayer is to the spiritual person. We literally can't breathe without prayer. It's in him that we live, we move and we have our being. To be honest with you, as we try to tackle love, there's no amount of experience or seminary training that could adequately prepare me to address the topic of love. One scholar said to try to explain love is the equivalent of you breaking a rose apart in order to explain its beauty. Like literally, as we try to tackle the topic of love, what we're literally trying to do is we're trying to explain the unexplainable. We're trying to apprehend something that's difficult to comprehend. We're trying to describe something that's indescribable. One songwriter used adjectives like overwhelming, never ending, reckless to describe the love of God. You know what? Let's first jump into the definitions of love. I think it's important for us to begin by defining love. Like it, for me, example, I love God. I love my family. I love Chick-fil-A. I love the Lakers. Drake said, and I quote, uh, she said, do you love me? I told her only partly. I only love my mom and my bed. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, like, think about it. Surely the love that I have for God can't be synonymous with the love that I have for Chick-fil-A or for the Lakers. Yeah, in similar fashion, surely the love that Drake has for his mom can't be synonymous with the love that he has for his bed. In English, we use one word to define love, whereas the Greeks are far more nuanced in their descriptions and definitions of love. For the Greeks, they use multiple words to describe and define love. For example, the first word that the Greeks use to define love is phileo. Phileo is brotherly love, hence the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This type of love is unique. You will actually become disappointed if you start expecting it from individuals who don't have the capacity to give it. This phileo love could be used to describe the relationship between David and Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan is the oldest of four sons and two daughters, and he's next in line to the throne. He already has a thousand troops under him. And his courage, loyalty, wisdom, and honor are all attributes that would benefit a king. However, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 18, after David finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate 
inextricable bond between them. For watch this, Jonathan loved David. King James says their souls were knit together. Yeah, the first thing I noticed about phileo love is that it can't be pulled apart. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan recognizes that we aren't in competition, but rather we're in a covenant. So he says, David, I'm not trying to compete with you. I'm actually trying to compliment you. Yeah, in covenant, team victories supersede individual success. The, 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 do you want to be an MVP on a losing team or would you rather win championships and get less individual recognition? That's a question you got to ask yourself. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1, now Saul urged his servants and his son Jonathan to assassinate David. But Jonathan, because of his strong affection for David, told him what his father was planning. He said, hey, look, dude, tomorrow morning uh, uh, you must find a hiding place because my dad is coming for you. Uh, I'll talk to my father and I'll find out what's going on. But look, the block is hot, so you got to roll out. The next thing I noticed about phileo love is that phileo protects. Not only can't phileo be pulled apart, but phileo protects. If your loyalty doesn't get good service in some areas, it ain't real loyalty. Yeah, loyalty through phileo love doesn't come with limitations. For real, don't tell me what they said about me until you can tell me why they felt comfortable to say it around you and also tell me what you said back when they said it. <laughs> yeah, phileo love is just as strong in public as it is in private. Blood may be thicker than water, but in the case of Jonathan and David, spirit is thicker than blood. Not only can't phileo love be pulled apart, not only does phileo love protect, but finally phileo love is perpetual. Yeah, yeah. The Bible says that Jonathan said to David, hey, look, go in peace because we've sworn loyalty towards each other in the Lord's name. He says uh, the Lord is our witness between me and you and between our children. They're saying that our bond is going to last forever. Yeah. If you keep taking pride in who you cutting off, then you ain't ready for phileo love. Phileo love transcends locations and generations. I declare that God is about to send phileo love towards people who are prepared to handle it. Yeah, he's going to give you the capacity to receive it and reciprocate it. There is someone who God is sending who's going to be strong in areas where you're weak. There is somebody that God is sending in your life, and when they arrive, do not perceive them through the lens of your past, but I I need you to perceive them through the lens of faith for your future. They are a sign to take you from where you are to where you're destined to be. The next type of love I see is story gay love. The yeah, story gay love is a love that a parent has for their child. It's a love that's difficult to explain. It, it, it literally has to be experienced. It's the love that I that I have for my children. It's the love that my wife has for our children. It's indescribable. It's the kind of love where parents know that the child may leave your lap, but they never leave your heart. It's the love that desires to set them up to become the best version of themselves. It's a love that is consistent even though the child is inconsistent. Another type of love is eros, where we get the word erotic. It's an erotic love. This is sensual. It's sexual. It is a love that is expressed through touch. It's literally created and designed by God to be acted out within the context of marriage between a husband and a wife. The church does itself and younger generations a disservice when we neglect to express and explain this type of love. Like if I only see Eros love on the internet or in music videos and I never see it modeled between married couples, I'll inadvertently get the perception that this love isn't for married couples. And since marriages don't have erotic type of love, then I'm not sure I want that. I'll feel that God is against something that he actually created. So now I'm suppressing something that God actually designed for me to express within the context of marriage. If you're married, I need you to allow your children 
children to see you and your spouse holding hands so they can see what Eros love looks like in marriage. They need to see you all kissing each other goodbye. They need to see you all wrapped up in a blanket, snuggled up together. Eros love doesn't come from the devil. Eros love comes from God. It should be a normal part of the definition and depiction of marriage that your children experience. Last, I save the best one, is agape love. Yeah, it's a godly, self-sacrificing love. Now that you have gotten the definitions of love, let's go over them again. Phileo, yeah, storge, eros, agape. Now that we have a requisite knowledge of the definitions of love, let's explore the directions of love. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, these biscuits are about to go crazy. <laughs> Call me Mr. Pillsbury. <laughs> you, you feel me? You got to grate your butter because that way it gets all up in there. I learned that from the Food Network, man. These biscuits. <laughs> yeah. Got my flour. Got my sugar. Did we bring baking soda? Um, bacon, no. Baking powder? Any? Ah, shoot. Don't trip. Don't trip. We just. Don't trip. We'll just do it without it. We'll just do it without it. It's all good. Now that we have a requisite knowledge of the definitions of love, let's go deeper and explore the directions of love. In order to process love, you must first go upward. First John 4 and 8 says, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Yeah, if you're going to process love, the first direction you got to go is upward. Think about this. God is love. It's a whole nother level. Like God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. But God says to himself, I want to experience love on a deeper level. So the Bible says, let us make man in God's image and in God's likeness. Game changer, because God recognizes in order for it to be real love, you got to have free will and you got to have choice. Like if it's legislated, if it's mandated, it's not real love. So what God says is I'm going to create something that has the potential to compete for my attention and I know I'm going to be rejected. Did you catch it? I know I'm going to be rejected. But the love from those who accept me is going to be greater than the pain of those who reject me. It's a game changer. A lot of times when you take a cursory glance at the Garden of Eden narrative and you see the tree. At first when I was a kid I was like, God, why would you put a tree there? You setting them up for sin. As I look at it and my knowledge goes a little bit deeper, I recognize that when God put the tree in the Garden of Eden, it's not a setup for sin, but it's actually a setup for love. <laughs> Every time they walk past the tree and don't partake of it, they're actually telling God, I love you more than what you created. Like God's love is on a whole other level. The Bible says when Adam and Eve sinned, God's love didn't stop. Like God's love kept going. Even when they were removed from the garden, they were removed with the intent of reconciliation and restoration. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Like God is so cold, even when he punishes you, the punishment is designed to put you back in position for him to bless you. The Bible says where sin did abound, grace does much more abound. So sin stops here, but grace keeps going even further. Yeah, the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world, the cosmos, those who are going to accept me, those who are going to reject me, those who are going to be atheists, murderers, liars, cheaters. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, not exclusive, but inclusive, Whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. 
God's love is unimaginable. It's unexplainable. If you're going to process love, you must first go upward. After you go upward, then you can go inward. Like literally your theology will start to impact your psychology. I think Paul does the best job at explaining the inward impact of receiving God's love from above. Romans 5 and 6 says, now when we were utterly helpless, uh, King James, while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ came just at the right time. I wish I could have church with somebody. <laughs> Is there anybody who knows that Jesus came just at the right time, just at the brink, just at the edge, just when I was on the verge of losing my mind, just when I was on the verge of risking it all, Jesus came in at the right time. The Bible says now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some might perhaps be willing to die for somebody who was good. But God, King James, commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, he didn't wait for me to get it right, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly cold-blooded. Verse number nine says, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Did you see that? We've been made right. I don't care how wrong you feel. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how long you did it. The Bible says we've been made right by the blood of Jesus. He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God has been restored by the death of his son while we were his enemies, we will certainly be saved through his life. Yeah, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship. Do you realize that when you are a slave to sin, you are an enemy of God? But it was at that time when God died for us while we were yet sinners. And now our relationship has been restored. We're now in right standing. We're no longer slaves, but now we are friends of God. You got to check out 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 says, such love has no fear because perfect love cast out, King James, all fear. If we're afraid, it's from fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. So many of us inwardly, we portray pseudo confidence to masquerade our levels of insecurity. Yeah, so I'm going to pretend I want to put filters on because I want to hide my level of insecurity. It's cold. Like we pretend, we present, we posture because we don't truly love ourselves. We sell ourselves out for likes, for retweets, uh, for reposts. Like we'll literally do the most on the Internet because we're searching for a type of love on the inside. If God showed his love by dying for us while we were sinners, you don't have to pretend. You missed what I just said. If God showed his love for us while we were sinners, that means that I don't have to pretend. He already showed his best love for me when I was at my worst. <laughs> I don't have to pretend. He already showed his best love for me when I was at my worst. Don't settle for the fake when you can have the real. Bring him your brokenness. He'll put it back together. Bring him your problems. He'll become your solution. A broken spirit and a contrite heart he will not despise. There's beauty in your brokenness. God is attracted to your authenticity. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 18 says and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide how long how high and how deep his love is when you realize God's love for you it'll revolutionize the love you have for yourself did you hear me I said when you realize God's love for you it will subsequently revolutionize the love that you have for yourself. It's a game changer. I rebuke every spirit of self-hate. Your self-hate is no match for God's love. If the enemy is telling you you are weak, God says my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Be strong in the Lord. Don't be strong in yourself. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
not your might, in the power of his might. I come against every spirit that tells you what you can do. Let the devil know I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. Every spirit that tries to incarcerate you with condemnation, I break it in the name of Jesus and I decree and declare there is therefore now no condemnation to those who were in Christ Jesus. You are not on probation. God says you have been acquitted. You are justified. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Do not allow the enemy to put you in a prison of condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who were in Christ Jesus who walks not after the flesh but after the spirit. God says I'm birthing a confidence inside of you that comes directly from heaven. Don't apologize for it. People are going to perceive you as arrogant. Let them know I'm not arrogant. I'm anointed. I'm not arrogant. I've been adopted. Yeah, you can get pregnant on accident but you can't adopt on accident. You have to adopt on assignment. Yeah, you're not what they call you. You're what you choose to answer to. I only choose to answer to what God calls me. God calls me a child of God. God calls me a branch of the true vine. God says if I abide in him and his words abide in me, I can ask whatever I will and he'll surely give it to me. I'm a friend of God. I'm justified. I'm an heir of God. I'm a joint heir with Christ. I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a peculiar people. I'm a holy nation. I'm free. I'm redeemed. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. According to Philippians 3 and 20, I'm a citizen of heaven. Once you experience God's love upwards, it can't help but get inward. After you process the love upwards, after you receive the love inwards, you can disseminate the love outwards. Matthew 22, they pull up on Jesus trying to get him caught up and they're like, hey, wait a second. Uh, the law of Moses, we got about 10 commandments and we got 613 laws of the mitzvah. What's the most important law in the law of Moses? Jesus comes at him so cold. Jesus says, okay, here's what I need you to do. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, vertical, and love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law all depends on these two commandments. Did you catch it? All the Ten Commandments are captured in two. Like, the ten tell you what not to do. The two tell you what to do. The ten put legislation before love. The two put love before legislation. In essence, if you keep the two, you kept the ten. Love God with all your heart. Yeah, the immaterial part of you, all your mind, all your soul, your will and your emotion and love your neighbor as yourself. If you struggle to love God, subsequently, you'll struggle to love yourself. When you struggle to love yourself, you'll struggle to love your neighbor. But when you love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength, you can't help but start to love yourself. When you love yourself, you can't help but love your neighbor. If you hate your neighbor, it's indicative of a disconnect from God and a lack of self-love. Yeah, First John chapter 4, verse 19 says, we love each other because he loved us first. The Bible says, if you say you love God, but you hate your neighbor, you're a liar. How in the world can you love God, who you can't see, but hate your neighbor, who you see on every day. God has commanded us to love our fellow believers. Do you realize that real Christians can't hate? Yeah, real Christians can't see somebody overtaken in a fault and start to gossip and put their business out in the street. Like real Christians, we restore such a one. Watch this, considering ourselves. Real Christians, when we see somebody get caught up in sin, uh, it's not a punchline. It's not a joke. It's not something to repost and retweet on the Internet. It's actually a situation where the Bible says if a brother be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, like there's not enough likes for me to celebrate the misfortune or the falling of somebody else. There's not enough affirmation or laughs that can make me feel comfortable in publicizing someone else's misfortune. The Bible says you who are spiritual, restore such one. Watch this, considering yourselves. Real Christians feel pain when any race is marginalized and oppressed. Did you catch it? I said real Christians feel pain when any race feels marginalized or oppressed. Press. Seeing people experiencing horrific conditions at the border, it makes me feel something. Seeing people being snatched and ripped apart from their families, it causes me to feel something. Seeing the Asian community experiencing their business being targeted, being hurt, being hated upon. Seeing 10 people die in the supermarket, I can't turn the channel. It causes me to feel something. God wants to take your life to a whole nother level through love. 
God wants to take the body of Christ to another level through love upward. I need to love God on a deeper level. I need to go deeper in my worship. I need to go deeper in my prayer. I need to go deeper in my seek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. God, I want to know your ways. God, I want to know your heart. As the deer pants after the water brooks, my soul is thirsty for you. God, there's a place inside of me that only you can feel. There's a void. There's a longing inside of me that I need you to satisfy. I need to go to a whole nother level inward. God, let your love penetrate my insecurities. Let your love eradicate my shame. Let your love break my negative self-perception. I want to go to another level in my outward love. They are my neighbor before they're a Democrat. They are my neighbor before they're a Republican. They are my neighbor before they're black or white, Asian or Latino. They are my neighbor before they're Kojic, Baptist, apostolic or non-denominational. Let me love my neighbor as myself by this Men will know I'm Christ's disciples by the love I have. Y'all got the hookup today. Y'all got service and you got breakfast about to go down. This gonna be crazy. Biscuits and gravy is kind of like my jam. When I learned how to make it, my wife, man, I'm telling you, she go crazy for this. So you get the flour in there so you can get that root going. We almost there. So we got the flour mixed in. Now here comes the best part. All we need is a little milk and then you got gravy. Y'all bring milk? <laughs> oh man. Ugh. Don't trip. Don't trip. It'll, it'll come out good without it. Don't trip. I ain't never made it like this, but it'll come out good without it. Woo! It's smelling good up in here. It's about to go down. We got the biscuits, bacon, gravy simmering. It's almost time to plate. Listen, we went through the definitions of love. We understand the directions of love. Upward, inward, outward. Now it's time to unpack the demonstration of love. Like you can't touch love without going to first Corinthians. Like literally, if you've been to any wedding, people abuse and misuse first Corinthians 13. Let me give you a little bit of context about Corinth. Corinth is like this port city where a lot of commerce and trade goes down. In Corinth, they are extremely wealthy, extremely affluent. It's a little bit of everything. There's diversity in Corinth. They are extremely cultured and familiar with the fine arts. You had sailors who would pull up in Corinth and they would hook up with the women. And subsequently, they gained the title of being Corinthian women. Like it was a whole nother level. The atmosphere in Corinth would be considered by so many as sinful. God doesn't tell Paul to run from this city to plant a church, but it's the exact opposite. God tells Paul to run to this city to plant a church. Like, I would argue that we need more churches that can minister within a Corinthian context. We need a church that is familiar with art, culture, fashion, who can discuss like the major impact that an artist such as Basquiat made in a little amount of time. We need somebody who can discuss Seurat and his style of pointillism and his artwork Sunday afternoon at the island of La Grande Jatte. Like, like Paul said, I became all things to all people so I could win them to Christ. We need a church that isn't afraid to have conversations about sex and sexuality and God's definitions and prescriptions for sex. Uh, let's flip it. Don't get it twisted. We also need a church that operates with intellectual prowess, excellence, but we need a church that is spirit filled. Yeah, our church at The Rock, we ain't either or, we're both and. Yeah, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You can't transform what you're afraid to touch. I'm going to say it again. You can't transform what you're afraid to touch. What do I miss most about in-person worship? Not just seeing your face, but I miss the smell of weed. 
You miss what I just said. Because when my church smells like weed, I know we're doing the right thing because we're attracting people who were saying, when I come to the rock, I can come as I am, but I'm not going to stay as I am. Jesus touched the lepers to heal them. Jesus touched two blind men at Capernaum so they could receive their sight. The woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus and her issue was dried up in that very moment. You got to be touchable at the Rock Church. Bring your issue, whatever you got. The Rock is where your history meets your destiny. I'm tired of stuck up churches that aren't touchable. If the dope dealers don't know your church, you should have never opened it. If doctors don't know your church, you should have never opened it. Your church is not designed to be either or, but God created it to be both and. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, don't matter what spectrum you on, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Corinth obviously had problems that mirrored the culture and the climate that they were situated in. But recognize when you're anointed, you don't see problems as end all. You actually see problems as opportunities for growth. It's so cold. Whenever a problem arises in Corinth, what Paul does is he uses the gospel to showcase a solution. Yeah, there was division in the Corinthian church. There was ethnic divide between Jews and Gentiles, social divide between uh, those who are wise and those who are foolish. Paul's solution is the gospel. He's like, wait, some of y'all are talking about uh, I'm a follower of Paul. Other people are talking about I'm from Apollos. And some people are talking about like I follow Peter and I only follow Christ. He's like, wait a second. Is Christ divided into factions? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm Paul, but I wasn't crucified for none of y'all. There's no division in the body of Christ. You were not baptized in the name of Paul. The messenger should never overshadow the message. I'm very concerned. We put a lot of faith in the messenger and not a lot of faith in the message. The message can't fail. The messenger can fail. So subsequently, when the messenger gets caught up, we think it discredits the message. The devil is a liar. Stop worshiping the people in the Bible and worship the God of the Bible. My political affiliation should never supersede my kingdom affiliation. If the church says my pastor says more than it says the Bible says there's a problem with that church. God's presence must be stronger than any personality. Jesus said, if I be lifted up <laughs> above the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. There was sexual immorality in the Corinthian church. Paul's response to sexual immorality, once again, is the gospel. He's like, wait a second. You can't say that your bodies are made for sexual immorality. They were actually made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies and God will raise us from the dead with his power just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are parts of Christ? Do you not know, King James, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? God forbid. He's saying you don't have the right to do whatever you want to do with your body because it's not your body. Did you catch it? He's saying your body, your mind, your soul, your spirit, it was redeemed by Jesus Christ through his death on Calvary's cross. So we glorify and we honor God through our bodies, through our sexual purity. The poor were being marginalized for every problem. Paul uses Jesus Christ and the gospel for his solution. The poor were being marginalized. Affluent Christians were abusing the Lord's Supper. What Paul says to them is when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. Yeah, some of y'all are coming here to eat your own meal and you don't want to share with other people. He's saying so like some of y'all are getting full while other people are starving. He answers this problem with the gospel. He's like, wait a second. If Jesus sacrificed himself so others could benefit, how can you not sacrifice some of your wealth to benefit other people? They ended up questioning, is there a resurrection from the dead? What does Paul do? He goes back to the gospel to provide an answer. He says, but tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of y'all talking about there's no resurrection of the dead? He's like, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then all of our preaching is useless and our faith is in vain. And we apostles would be all lying about God for we said that Christ was raised from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ 
is not raised. He's saying if Christ is not raised from the dead, then we have no hope. But in fact, Christ is raised from the dead. He is the first harvest. He's the first fruit of the resurrection. He's saying if Jesus got up from the grave, then the dead in Christ will also get up from the grave. We believe in a literal heaven. We believe in a literal heaven. We believe that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will arise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. If he got up from the grave, not only will I get up from the grave, but I'll get up from every grave of depression. I'll get up from every grave of poverty. I'll get up from every grave from my past. I can get up from rejection. For every problem, the gospel has a solution. The solution to the problem of sin is the gospel, the birth, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not preaching without the gospel. It's just a motivational speech. Yeah, I'm all about our church being holistic, but not at the expense of our church being holy. It's the gospel for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the gospel that saves us for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. If you want me to pray at your gathering conference or event bar mitzvah or or King Sinietta, and you don't want me to say in Jesus name, then I'm not the right person for you. Good advice will never replace the good news of the gospel. It is the gospel that saves life. It's the gospel that takes us from death to life. I am not ashamed of the gospel. So Paul navigates through the nuance of this new Corinthian church. He closes out chapter 12 by talking to them about spiritual gifts. They were caught up on the demonstration of gifts, but the gifts were demonstrated devoid of love. He opens up chapter 13 and he unpacks love. He says, look, if you can speak in tongues and speak all the languages of heaven and earth, but you don't love other people, you're like a sounding brass, King James, and a tinkling cymbal. He's saying if I have the kind of faith where I can move mountains, but I don't have love. I'm nothing. He's saying, even if I gave everything to the poor and I sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love other people, I gained nothing. (laughs) You know what, y'all? I'm ready to eat, man. It's smelling too good in here. Um, Last thing I want to make is something to wash it down. I want to make y'all freshly squeezed orange juice. Game changer, especially if you get the right oranges. Um, where do we put the oranges? We don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> we should. <laughs> I told y'all we should. <laughs> we should have baptized without a little bit better. <laughs> oh man, I'm supposed to be cooking for the church. You mean to tell me we got? Biscuits with no <laughs> bacon powder. We got gravy with no milk. <laughs> and I'm supposed to make orange juice with no oranges? <laughs> oh, man. I forgot. And I also forgot also forgot to tell y'all what the title of my message is. I'm forgetting everything today. The title of my message is The Missing Ingredient. Because if I got everything else, but I don't have love, I ain't got nothing. How much I speak in tongues don't matter if I can't speak to my spouse or my children. You know what? I'm going to keep it a thousand. I've been in church all my life. And when a guest preacher comes, I don't look directly at the preacher. I side eye, low key, pay attention to the, to the family. I pay attention to their spouse (laughs) because if the spouse is doing their nails or eating a blow pop or scrolling, chances are they like he don't live. She don't live what they preach at home. My ability to flow in the prophetic and decree and declare the mysteries of God means nothing if I don't have love. Like if I properly harmonize my hermeneutic and I publicly explicate what I've privately exegeted and I do all of that with no love, it don't mean nothing. Yeah, if I got faith to believe for people to be healed from cancer and I got faith to move mountains, but I don't have love, it don't mean nothing. 
Because if I don't have love, I'll have so much faith that I'll move the mountain out of my way and I'll put it directly in somebody else's way. <sighs> love is the missing ingredient. Like if we give everything to the poor, we do rock outside the walls. Like if we feed hospital workers during the pandemic, if we bring dinner to our seniors and those impacted by COVID-19, if we do a Thanksgiving giveaway, if we support foreign missions, if we do Christmas giveaways, if we do our gas giveaway this coming Saturday, if we bless our home insecure community, if we do all of that and we didn't do it with love, we didn't do nothing. God is showing us it's possible to do the right things, but do it for the wrong reasons. Love is patient. Love, love is love. Love is patient. I'm irritable because I want what I want and I want it right now. Notice patient is next to kindness. Love is patient and it's kind because impatient people generally are short tempered, easily triggered. And they're highly combustible. Yeah, not only does love allow you to be patient with them, but love gives you the power to be patient with yourself. Do you realize that everybody, including yourself, is going through a process? Be patient in the process. Love isn't jealous or proud. Like insecurity is loud. Confidence is composed. Jealousy is concerned with everything that's on the outside. If the success, blessing, or fortune of others elicits anything inside of me other than love and appreciation, I need God to rid me of that. Like if you scroll, you see it and you like it, but something inside of you says, don't click like, God rid me of that. Better yet, if you see somebody in your field who's doing better than you, I need you to sow into them. You missed what I just said. I need you to sow into them. It's hard to hate what you've invested in. <laughs> love ain't rude. Love ain't rude. I'm about to lose everybody right here, especially the church people. Love ain't rude. How are you going to go to the council, the convention, the convocation, the church meeting, the church service, and then go to Denny's IHOP, come here, Midwest people, Perkins, uh -huh, Baker Square, and how are you going to have a party of 30, and then you're going to order everything on the menu, get every condiment, everybody got five refills each, you ask for separate checks, and then you're only going to tip a dollar. Love ain't rude. <laughs> love doesn't demand its own way. Love is not irritable. You, you literally, you need love, a Snickers, and a Snuggie. Yeah, yeah, love keeps no records of being wrong. You know what, man? Psh, I ain't messing with them. Nah, nah, they shady. Like, 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 what if you caught them at a bad time? Like, what if you caught them at a moment where their life was falling apart? So you've taken one sound bite, one moment, and use that to judge their entire life. Like love bears no records of wrong. Like, dude, don't trust them. What happened? Man, they owe me money. What? 5,000? No. Nah. 1,000? No. Nah. 100? Man, I loaned them $5. When? 20 years ago. They literally about to file <laughs> for... <laughs> for social security and you're holding them and tripping off of five dollars from 86 the devil is a liar what if god said look i'm gonna keep your records the way you keep records for everybody else <laughs> the same level of mercy you show other people that's the same level of mercy i'm gonna show you love keeps no records of wrong the reason why i forgive other people is because i need the lord to forgive me <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Love doesn't rejoice about injustice. Ahmad walked into the grocery store and killed 10 people and was apprehended this week in Colorado by the police. But down the street, Elijah McClain was killed while he apologized for not doing nothing. That screams injustice. Robert Aaron Long went on a shooting spree 
targeting the Asian community, yet he was safely apprehended. Duke Webb shot up a bowling alley in Illinois, but yet and still he was safely apprehended. Catherine Castillo drove through a crowd of Black Lives Matters protesters and was arrested and released on her own recognizance. Kyle Rittenhouse shot three people, killed two people during the protest of Jacob Blake and was peacefully arrested. Dylan Roof walked into a church and killed nine black people in Charleston, South Carolina, and he was arrested and reportedly taken to Burger King. Conversely, Rayshard Brooks, unarmed, shot and killed. Conversely, George Floyd had a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Daniel Prude, unarmed and killed. Breonna Taylor, unarmed, asleep and killed. When unarmed people are being killed and killers are being arrested safely, in the words of Keith Sweat, something, something just ain't right. It's injustice. Before you politicize this, filter it through the lens of love. <sighs> Do you realize how dangerous the body of Christ would be? If we didn't allow the church to be infiltrated with the politics of the world, if anybody should be able to step up, it should be the church to say, according to my Bible, that's not a good look. I don't care what my denomination represents. The devil is a liar. If I feel your culture before I feel your Christ, that means your culture's too strong. The Bible says love never gives up. At the Rock Church, one guarantee I got is that we'll never give up on you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how long you've done it. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Lose your money, but don't lose your faith. Lose your house, but don't lose your faith. Lose your car, but don't lose your faith. Lose your job, but don't lose your faith. Why? Because if you got faith, you can get more money. If you got faith, you can get a better house. If you got faith, you can get a better car. If you got faith, you can get a better job. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful. Love Love endures all. The missing ingredient is love. Love is the missing ingredient. Like when you do the right things, without love, you will feel unfulfilled. But when you put some love in it, when you put some agape love in it, when love hits you from above and it goes inside and it comes outside, it'll change everything. Love is a noun and a verb. <laughs> love literally has to become who we are now. And love also has to be a verb in what we do. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful and it endures through every circumstance. Have you ever considered what would happen when you replace love with Jesus? Because God is love and Jesus says, I am my father are one. That means if God equals love and God equals Jesus, that means Jesus equals love. What the Bible says is prophecy speaking in unknown tongues, it'll cease but love will last forever. When I was a child, Paul says, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. It's literally immature for me to operate at this level without love. God, redefine love for me. God, teach me what agape, self-sacrificing love should be. Let me define all of my subsequent relationships through the lens of my primary relationship with God. God, give me the direction of love. Upward, inward, and outward. God says, when I died on the cross, I showed my love for you while you were sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. I need you to receive God's love. If you've never been baptized in Jesus name, if you've never been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you have not received God's best for you. God says it's a gift. 
text grow 925-233-0174. We are ready to baptize you in Jesus' name. And Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, is ready to come inside of your life. Like, make that a reality. If you would love to be a member of the Rock Church family, we would love to have you. Type grow in the comments. Text 925-233-0174. We also have live intercessors standing by, ready to pray with you. All you got to do is click the link in the chat and you'll be directed to our virtual prayer room and we will intercede on your behalf. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for every soul who's typing grow. We thank you for every soul who's making a decision to be baptized in your name. Lord, forgive us for allowing Satan to talk us out of experiencing your best. We receive your love upward, inward, and we display it outward. God, fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is our prayer. Thank you for every new member. God, transform us during this Passion Week. God, I pray, Lord, that you will push us to another level. This is the week. I don't believe it's coincidence that you teach about love. The week where you gave us the greatest demonstration of it. We praise you in advance for everything you're going to do in the lives of your people. In Jesus name. Amen.